European Union Withdrawal Agreement Bill, Lord Callanan. Uh, thank you. <laughs> this bit is really easy. My, my Lords, I beg to move that this bill be now further considered on report. The question is that this report be now further considered on report. As many of that opinion will say content, the contrary not content, the contents have it. After Clause 35, Amendment 17, Lord Thomas of Cumgeath. In seeking to move this Amendment 17, we seek to insert a new clause after Clause 35. We are doing this in a much slimmed down version of the clause that was before the House in Committee as Amendment 29. We do this in furtherance of the objective of strengthening the Union. In this instance, through the second means through which I referred yesterday, by ensuring proper consultation, we seek to set out the short principle that the Joint Ministerial Committee for EU negotiations should be a statutory committee with clear purposes. Nowhere does the amendment seek to prescribe how the committee is to work, nor requiring the making of statements, nor requiring anything else at all that might be thought to impede the proper conduct of the negotiations with the European Union. It is simply there to ensure the principle is accepted on the statute that this committee has a clear and defined purpose. I would have hoped that in the light of the many speeches made at the committee stage, it was clear that statutory recognition of this committee is required, given the way which so many described as to how it had operated. If that was not the case at the committee stage, I would have thought from the debates yesterday in relation to Clause 21 that it should have demonstrated to Her Majesty's Government how important it is to deal with the position of the devolved governments and legislatures. It is a simple fact that our Constitution has changed during the period we have been in the European Union. We must therefore achieve a workable set of constitutional provisions to make that Constitution work with the governments and legislatures in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, and simply not with this legislature and the government in London. Otherwise, the Union will be imperiled. This is a small step towards that end. Now, clearly, the conduct of international relations and negotiations is a reserved matter. And as I said yesterday, there are plenty of powers, not only in the existing uh, legislation, but in the clause that was carried yesterday to enable uh, the ministers to ensure that in the devolved administrations, the international obligations incurred by Her Majesty's Government are observed. But surely the United Kingdom must recognise uh, that those are powers of last resort. And the proper approach is to involve the devolved governments fully in the negotiations by consulting them and trying to reach a consensus. As this very modest amendment makes clear, this is not in any way intended to impose any veto. It is simply a way of trying to persuade and ensure that the government acts in such a way that it strengthens the Union. And it takes into account, and is seen to take into account, the interests of Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, as expressed through their constitutional <coughs> institutions. This question of perception is extremely important if the Union is to be strengthened. There is a further consideration. The effect of the arrangements relating to the Northern Ireland Protocol is to give Northern Ireland, the Northern Ireland Government attendance at some of the meetings of the Joint Committee. That is to say, the Joint Committee for the negotiations between Europe and the United Kingdom. This amendment relating to the Joint Ministerial Committee, and possibly it's a, unfortunate that we have two committees with very, very similar names, is really designed to ensure that the other two nations have the opportunity and are seen to have the opportunity of expressing their interests so that the UK government can go forward with everyone knowing that those have been heard. 
And it is a striking fact that countries such as Germany and Canada manage to conduct international relations whilst respecting the competencies of their states and other institutions that make up their countries. Indeed, the EU itself has conducted its negotiations successfully by taking into account the interests of the 27 other member states. I fear, however, that the United Kingdom government has not caught up with the impact of devolution on our constitution. They really ought to be doing all they can to help those who seek to strengthen the Union by ensuring that devolved governments not only act not only are consulted in accordance with the spirit of the Constitution, but its letter. It surely isn't too much to ask of, uh, of the United Kingdom government, as today the Welsh government is considering uh, the legislative consent motion to think again about doing something to put on the statute book a clear commitment to the Joint Ministerial uh, Committee. This, I believe, it is a critical issue, and if a difference could be made here, it would be far better to see the Union go forward to our important stage in the development of our nation with the consent of all the devolved governments and not to risk the Welsh uh, uh, legislature taking a different view. Might I suggest that if possible, the government think again now? Look at this clause. It does nothing more than embody what should be clear. And I would very much hope that when the Minister comes to deal with this issue, he can give assurance, if possible, a commitment to this clause, but also a clear assurance that this committee is going to work as it should work. <coughs> but, as has been so ably explained at the committee stage, is not working. It's not a lot to ask. It's asked to strengthen the union. And I do think it's important that the government should try and help those who wish to strengthen the union, because there are many who do not. Amendment proposed, insert the new clause as printed in the Marshall list. Apologies, my Lord, Apologies, Lord Speaker. Um, my Lords, I, I fully support the desire of, expressed by the noble, Lord, Lord, noble and learned Lord, Lord Thomas, that there should be full consultation between the government and the devolved administrations and indeed the assemblies in, in uh, the devolved countries. Uh, I fully support his plea for mutual courtesy and respect. I question, however, whether, it, whether this new clause is appropriate. I doubt myself whether it's, it's appropriate to lay down in statute the procedures for consultation between the government and the devolved ad administrations to, uh, as it were, so formalise the agenda that it's placed in a kind of Procrustean bed. I think this could be too rigid and too inflexible. Uh, of course, as he, as he urges, all concerned should seek consensus, and that is going to be extremely important in terms of ensuring that uh, what emerges uh, out of the negotiations on the withdrawal, on, on, on the future relationship uh, between, the, between the United Kingdom and the EU is viable in each of the uh, devolved territories. However, it seems to me that the achievement of consensus must be a matter of culture. I don't think that you can legislate the consensus. And I, th I think that if you, if you legislate and there still isn't the, the goodwill and the willingness for give and take and the willingness to achieve mutual understanding, it won't actually work. So strongly as I support the objectives of the noble and learned Lord in this amendment, I think the means that he proposes to achieve what we all desire may not be the right ones. My Lords, uh, I beg to support the amendment moved by the noble and learned Lord. Uh, I don't know from whom I am quoting, but the Joint Ministerial Committee is a poor thing, but our own. It hasn't worked very well. It hasn't met very frequently. There has been no programme. Its membership has varied, 
uh, and uh, it has not been a particularly effective uh, arrangement so far. Hence, it is important, in my view, that it should be put on a statutory basis, in which case there would be a report to, the House, to Parliament. We would know where we stood, and so far we don't know. And uh, the, the devolved administrations, they never know when the present Joint Ministerial Committee would meet. It is important, for the sake of the Union, to achieve a consensus where possible. Uh, in our discussion yesterday on another amendment of the Noble and Learned Lord, it was obvious there had been no discussion with the Welsh Assembly. The uh, reply of the Minister uh, was less than persuasive, I fear, to the debate that we had. Uh, and, uh, if we, uh, there was an alternative arrangement which could have been used, Section 109 of an Order in Council, which would result in a consensual as opposed to an imposed change. Hence, uh, I would support very much in the hope that there would be a change of heart in Westminster. <coughs> there is, I fear, still a denial in the Westminster establishment that devolution has taken place at all. It's been there now a long time. It is part of our establishment. And legislators, and particularly those who draft governments, draft bills for government, should <coughs> recognise that there are other devolved administrations set up within the United Kingdom, and they are there to further the Union. And I would hope that if this amendment is accepted, that this would strengthen the Union, it would put the committee on a proper basis, and then there would be an expectation of regular, frequent, and meetings set up where there will be serious and senior representation from the Westminster Government. I beg to support. My Lords, I'm most grateful to the noble Lord, Lord Morris of Aberavon, for his words now in support of this amendment that has my name, and I would like to reiterate the words of my noble and learned friend, Lord Morris uh, of Cungeith, who has made clear that we're seeking to persuade the government to think again. If I may just respond to some of the comments made by the noble Lord, uh, Lord Howarth of Newport. <coughs> Our amendment is not prescriptive. It simply requires that if there is a forum that meets regularly, but it doesn't stipulate how often it should meet. Meeting means face-to-face -face discussion, mm -hmm. and that it is there to uh, discuss the means of mitigating the impact on the economic and security aspects envisaged in the future relationship on the constituent parts of the United Kingdom. It is to avoid problems arising in the future. We have already heard that negotiations with the EU are likely to result in agreements which have very direct impact on many aspects of devolved competence. I would like to highlight just a few of these, some of which are very close to my heart. Firstly, the capacity of Welsh universities to access EU research funds and collaborative projects in the future. Over the last 20 years, access to these funds and the networks which they have have generated uh, and, it, and have, they've been proved critical to boosting the research capacity of Welsh higher education institutions, including medical research. Indeed, a finding from Cardiff University was a headline yesterday in the new ways of managing cancers. We've been reliant, dependent and have built on the funds that we've accessed. The interaction between projects funded by research and development framework programmes and those funded by the structural funds have been particularly important, as the Welsh Government has demonstrated in its publication, Research and Development After Brexit. Whether and how the UK and therefore Wales can access these funds will be determined by the negotiations with the EU. Secondly, whether there are are in future any reciprocal arrangements between the EU and the UK to access health services will again be a matter for negotiations. 
I would support such arrangements, but it needs to be recognised that if such commitments are made by the UK Government, it is the Welsh NHS which will pick up the cost of treatment provided in Wales. Thirdly, there is the issue of procurement rules. Procurement is a devolved matter, and the Welsh Government is certainly interested in strengthening the way in which procurement can support rather than undermine local purchasing. But we know that the EU, as part of the insistence on maintaining a level playing field, will start from the position that the EU approach to procurement must continue even post-Brexit. Wales needs to have a voice in the discussion within the UK negotiating team about any trade-off between flexibility on procurement and unfettered access to the EU market. My Lords, I could give many more examples. The, state, the future of state aid rules governing the assistance which Welsh Government may give to Welsh businesses, access to European markets of Welsh agri-food, products such as lamb, beef and seafood, whether or not Welsh students and pupils will have access to the Erasmus Plus programme of student in exchanges are to name but a few. The key point is that the Welsh Government and the Senate will be bound by the outcomes of the negotiations, which will begin in only a few weeks' time. Indeed, we have already heard Ministers of the Crown have the powers to force the devolved institutions to comply if they disagree with these outcomes. Under these circumstances, it surely makes sense for the Government to start from the position where the default is to reach agreement with the devolved administrations in an approach to negotiations. Otherwise, I fear the result will be bitter and prolonged conflict, indeed very <coughs> prolonged, between the devolved institutions and the government, and that in itself will seriously threaten the union itself. Yeah. I rise to support the amendment mm. and to respectfully disagree with uh, some of the sentiments expressed by the noble Lord Howard. My Lords, the Government can no longer afford the luxury of an underdeveloped and informal arrangement with the devolved administrations. The proposed JMC needs to function properly and to meet regularly and in ideally frequently to deal with the details of EU negotiations and going forward, I would suggest, with the detail of relationships with the EU in the future. If you want to maintain the union, and I believe the government very strongly wants to do that, then you will need to treat the devolved administrations <laughs> with the respect they deserve. Not least, it's an issue of common sense. It's often not obvious to civil servants and to ministers here what impact their negotiations will have on the devolved administrations. Very often, it is simply a sin of omission, a failure to understand the full detail and significance of devolved powers and the impact that would have on the countries concerned. And that's understandable. After all, no one can be an expert in everything. I have argued for years, my lords, that the EU as the origin for many rules, regulations and a source of funding has taken the party political edge of decisions it makes because they're done on an EU-wide basis. They are not regarded as having party political significance. Once that ends, the party politics will become really quite vicious, I believe, in the future, if you do not provide for proper channels of negotiation and discussion. And, and the noble lady, Finlay, has laid out that issue very ably. 
Uh, she has also talked about the impact on many of the aspects of life in Wales. She referred to universities in some detail. I must declare an interest as Chancellor of Cardiff University, but I am aware that that university looks constantly and in detail at the impact of each of the negotiations as they have gone forward on the life of that university, on research funding, on research partnerships with institutions in Europe. There is also, of course, the impact on Wales of the proposed and rather confused arrangements for Northern Ireland. And that is something which, as it works through, and I would point out to noble lords that the government itself doesn't seem to have one single understanding of what that agreement means. Uh, as that works its way through, it is bound to have a very strong impact on Wales. Now, the Minister will know that I am not given to flights of nationalist fantasy, and nor is there any sympathy on these benches for independence, either in Scotland or Wales. However, and bearing in mind again the words of the noble lady Finlay, I urge the government to be careful what you wish for. I am well aware that there are many, both at official and at ministerial level, who still regard devolution as a bit of a nuisance, yet another hurdle to be overcome, an unnecessary level of complexity. But it is well established, and in Scotland, nationalist sympathies are very strong. They could grow stronger in Wales if this is not sorted neatly and effectively, my lords. At the very least, uh, officials here and ministers often do not fully understand the implications of the decisions they're making. And that's what's behind this attempt by the government to write the devolved administrations out of the picture. It is easier to ignore them than to pay particular attention to them. I would say to the government that if you succeed in this, if you succeed in ignoring the devolved administrations, then you may well live to regret it. The noble Lady Finlay has put her finger on the nub of all this when she talks about trade-offs. Any agreement that we actually reach with the EU at the end of the day will be a series of compromises. And if we have individual um, delegated bodies taking hard stands on one position or another, or indeed one industry taking a hard position on one position or another, we're never going to get the compromises that we need to get our deal to go through. And that is why the noble Lord Lord Howarth is right, that we actually cannot bind the government's hands on this issue. And Lady Sanderson, um, she uh, acknowledges that the union is very, very important to this government, and indeed it is to all of us in this House, I think. Um, and are we really going to sacrifice the union um, by reaching arbitrary decisions that discriminate against one part of the union or another. No, of course we're not. But we need to make compromises, and the government should not have its hands tied by individual bodies or regions of this country taking a hard line on one position or another. Um, I rise uh, having my name to uh, the, this amendment, uh, but I do so with some trepidation. Um, I'll try not to have a flight of nationalist fantasy, as the noble <laughs> Baroness uh, Randerson mentioned a moment ago. Um, and I hesitate about bringing you a discordant note. We hear a lot about the strengthening of the Union. We must ask ourselves exactly what we mean by that. If it's to make the Union work more effectively and more harmoniously, and to be more sensitive to the needs outside Westminster or Whitehall, and to have greater empathy, then, of course, that is something that is highly desirable. But I wonder if that is the case. If it is to strengthen the grip of Westminster and Whitehall and to impose policies 
that are not in the best interests of either Wales or Scotland and Northern Ireland, then that clearly is something that is going to cause a lot of bitterness. And the mechanisms that we're talking about here are in order to avoid that sort of bitterness arising. Now, I would have thought that it was patently in the interest of those who want to hold the United Kingdom in its present form together that at least some movement is made to ensure that we don't have the clashes arising from a difference of aspiration or even a misunderstanding between the governments of the various parts uh, nations of these islands. We need Westminster to be sensitive when there are, for example, reports, universally accepted reports on changes in the relationships, such as we've had in Wales in relation to the legal system. The noble Lord, Lord uh, Thomas has uh, brought forward an excellent report. The changes, the Silk Report suggested for the police and prisons. And when those are universally accepted in Wales and then are just totally ignored year after year here, then it's hardly surprising that there is some feeling um, uh, of there being a, a failure of the system from the centre to work in the interests of every area. Now, then, it's very, very relevant that this issue is arising in the context of European legislation, because noble lords will remember that in 1979, very shortly after we'd joined the European Union, in 1979 there was a referendum in Wales where the vote went four to one against having a devolved government. The noble Lord, Lord Morris, was very much involved in that. There were several factors that led to the changes between 1979 and 1997, when there was a very small majority, but a majority in favour of establishing a National Assembly. And one of the factors was the advent and development of the European dimension. Because with the advent of Europe came the acceptance that there is a multi-layered system of democracy, that the principle of subsidiarity that runs through the European vision is something that was relevant within these islands. There are some things within the structures that we've got that are appropriate to be discussed and decided um, at Westminster, some as was, as is until the end of next week on a European level, and some which are more appropriate on a Welsh or Scottish or Northern Ireland basis. Now then, it seems that there's a possibility now of turning the clock back from the vision that had developed over the last 40 years to what existed before 1979. And if that's the case, then that, my lords, is the most likely thing that is going to drive ahead a change forced from the periphery in the structures of these islands, the sort of change that many noble lords have mentioned and fe are fearful about. Now, then, in the context of this specific amendment, all that is being asked for is for there to be a provision that there is a systematic approach towards this that takes into account the needs of the devolved nations. That's not an unreasonable thing to look for. And the fact that Northern Ireland yesterday and Scotland before and probably this afternoon Wales will refuse the orders that are being requested in the context of this bill is surely an indication that something is being got wrong from the centre. And I would urge the government to look at this amendment in that context, to see it as an opportunity to build a better, more harmonious relationship, rather than just to um, stamp on it and hope that the uh, feelings in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland will just go away. My Lord, may I raise a short constitutional question which came up last week, which relates to this. In our debate on Clause 38 uh, last Thursday, um, the noble Lord, Lord Keane from the Government Front Bench said that Dicey is the, or, the absolute authority on parliamentary sovereignty. Dicey's views on parliamentary sovereignty was that parliamentary sovereignty is indivisible. It cannot be shared upwards or downwards. His views were strengthened by his bitter opposition to the whole idea of home rule, either for Ireland or for Scotland. And he believed strongly that um, the imperial parliament was therefore the only authority of British imperial law. Now, that doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty strongly held is, of course, one of the reasons why those who have wished us to leave the European Union uh, have objected to the whole principle of European law uh, interfering with the sovereignty of British law as defined by Parliament. It does seem to me, therefore, that as part of the process we go through as we leave the European Union, 
And as we proceed towards some sort of constitutional convention, we are going to have to redefine the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty so as to accept that these devolved assemblies, these devolved nations, have more than the occasional permission of the Westminster Parliament to do what they wish, but they have certain entrenched rights which are not compatible with the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty as defined by this rather prejudiced late Victorian lawyer. My Lords, um, some of the speeches have painted on a large and wide canvas, and I'd like to focus down on, on the amendment itself. However, I, I would begin by reminding myself of a discussion here yesterday about the possibility, perhaps fatuous, of moving this chamber to York in the name of reaching out to the population of this country. Uh, I simply mention that because uh, 20 years ago, in the name of reaching out to the country at large, the devolved uh, administrations came into being. And the 20 years in between have offered enough evidence of the fact that you don't just bring things into being, you support and sustain them by developing a relationship that actually enhances partnership between the devolved bodies and the United Kingdom Parliament. I, I do wish that people on uh, uh, other benches would realise just how disappointed the people in the devolved areas are about what has happened over the last 20 years and the way in which begrudgingly, again and again, as it seems to them, uh, some concessions, some developments have come into being. Um, I, I just wish people could feel that. Uh, I had, uh, we have three children. I know that when they were growing up as teenagers, the most important aspect of parenthood that we had to learn about as parents was the moment when you establish the trust. You move away from authoritarian uh, modes of existence with your own children and you trust them even sometimes when they make mistakes. Now, it does seem to me that, um, that we are asking here in this amendment um, simply to give visibility to a stance we could describe as trust. That seems to me to be at the heart of it. Uh, as has been said by Noble Noble, Noble, Noble Thomas, um, it, it doesn't seek to uh, change um, the provisions of the bill, it just says we trust each other as we go along. Now, I've had to educate myself, I have to say, and I'd be surprised if I'm the only one who's needed to do this, because this amendment, if accepted, would go in um, after clauses in the bill that describe the UK-EU Joint Committee. And it is terribly confusing to be talking about the Joint Ministerial Committee um, in the context of movements that bring that joint EU-UK committee into being. But it is, and it's not even, um, the, <laughs> it doesn't end there, because the Joint Ministerial Committee, European Union subcommittee is what we're talking about, and the action that we are trying to establish good relationships for is what will happen in the period of, uh, that follows the enactment of this bill, uh, in the period of discussions with Europe um, to, to, to bring about our ongoing relationship. So it, it seems to me we should remember it is for a limited period that we are looking to have these things written off the face of the bill. My noble friend Lord Howarth is quite right. Of course you can't legislate for the processes of consultation. Of course you can't. But he also went on to say that willingness can't be legislated for, but unwillingness might necessitate legislation. And there has been unwillingness there is a lack of empathy. Even the, the noble lord um, across there who just spoke about hardness and refusing to accept uh, a position in order that, that will create its difficulties or feel like a v that's never in anybody's minds at all. At all. Not at all. So it seems to me that um, I go back to the discussions at committee stage and the intervention there um, by Lord Kerr. The best option, he said, 
would be to include representatives of the devolved administrations in the negotiating teams that go to Brussels when the subject for discussion is going to touch on the competence of the devolved administrations. If they're going to discuss the competence of the devolved administrations, is it not fair and proper that those uh, from the devolved administrations most affected by them might be there to add their voice to the discussions? Is it not reasonable? Are we not talking about common sense? This binary way of looking at this, that everybody who has a different view somehow is invested with animosity towards the government, we're talking about bringing out of all of this something that stands up and appeals to people on the basis of common decency and fair play. And there, I'm happy to rest my case. Uh, my, my Lords, we strongly uh, support Amendment 17, without which the whole nation of Wales could be excluded from preparing for or inputting into the UK EU negotiations. For some parts of the UK, as the Noble Lord, uh, Noble Lord, Lord, Lord Thomas uh, said, and as the letter from the Noble Lord, Lord Duncan, to your Lordships of the 16th of January, which I hope people have now got, sets out, um, the government has promised representatives of the Northern Ireland Executive to be invited to be part of the UK delegation to any meetings of the Joint Committee discussing Northern Ireland where the Irish government is involved. Now, that guarantee is welcome. I'm not undermining that at all. But where is the equivalent recognition that where other constituent parts of the UK might also have their specific issues being discussed as we've just heard, that they too can be at the table, or at the very least be assured that the JMC uh, on European negotiation has been briefed on and fed into Our Majesty's Government's negotiating position with the EU. My Lords, the Government is being seen, as we've said before, to be giving scant regard to the devolved authorities' interests and legitimate role in the negotiation, and that's why a statutory role is needed, because, as my noble and learned friend, Lord uh, Morris of Aberavon, said, the voluntary way has not worked sufficiently well. <coughs> but if the government was to disagree with that view that it should be statutory, and if they shared the view of my noble friend, Lord Howarth, then there's still a non-statutory alternative available. And that would be for the next meeting of the JMC to adopt a process whereby the devolved administrations will have meaningful engagement with the negotiations, including an expectation that UK ministers will normally agree with the devolved authorities in the negotiation position in, relations, in relation to issues within devolved competencies. The sorts we've heard about, Erasmus, Horizon, reciprocal health care and indeed citizens' rights in elections to local and devolved elections, both for the Assembly and for this Parliament and indeed for the people of the devolved authorities. Agreement on this process should be made and made public, not the details of the negotiations, but the assurance that the devolved voices are being heard. We'd also welcome the creation of quadrilateral fora, building on what already is there at ministerial level to handle some of this detailed negotiation. None of this detracts from the timing of the talks, nor the ability of the UK government to take full account of the whole of the UK. Nor does it add a veto, and it would still allow for the sort of consensus compromises that would be needed, as the noble Lord, Lord Hamilton, spoke about. But it would add some of the trust that my noble friend Lord Griffiths says is needed and ensure that special interests and the competencies, including in relation to impotentation of the devolved administrations, are fully factored into the negotiations and thus part of developing a working and successful partnership with the EU, as both the noble ladies, Lady Finlay and Randerson, have spoken of.
My Lords, I am grateful to the noble and learned Lord, Lord, Lord Thomas, and indeed all noble Lords who have spoken to this amendment. And I feel it's appropriate for me to start off by saying something with a, with a degree of emphasis about the Joint Ministerial Committee, which I have to say has received an undeservedly negative press from some of your Lordships, both in committee and today. The Government has a high regard for the Joint Ministerial Committee structure and has engaged with the devolved administrations through it and indeed through numerous other means throughout the EU exit process. The Joint Ministerial Committee on EU Negotiations, the JMC EN, I will call it, was established in the months following the UK's decision to leave the EU and has met 21 times since November 2016. From the government's point of view, and I hope from everyone's, it has proved an invaluable forum for the exchange of information and views between the UK and the devolved administrations. Proposals for intergovernmental engagement on the next stage of negotiations formed a large part of the most recent meeting of the Joint Ministerial Committee on EU negotiations earlier this month and are due to be discussed again at the next meeting of the JMCEN next week, chaired, if my memory serves me right, by the Welsh Government. I hope I can give a sense of how effective a forum the JMCEN has been for discussions on this bill. The bill was first discussed at the JMCEN in the summer of 2018 when we gave the devolved administrations the opportunity to feed into the white paper. We then used the forum to share our thinking on policy development through the autumn and winter of 2018, sharing iterative drafting on the bill. It was through these discussions that we made changes to the bill to address the concerns of the devolved administrations. This included providing them with an important role in appointments to the board of the IMA, both in the bill itself and through ministerial commitments. I therefore do not accept that the JMCEN has been either inactive or ineffectual. On the contrary, it has contributed significantly to both ministerial and official engagement between the UK Government and the devolved administrations, and that's exactly the way we mean to continue. The amendment seeks essentially to set the joint ministerial arrangements in concrete. My Lords, it remains the Government's firm view that it is not in the interests of the UK Government or the devolved administrations to place the terms of reference of the JMCEN or the Memorandum of Understanding on, uh, on devolution on a statutory footing. The noble Lord Lord Howarth and my noble friend Lord Hamilton of Epsom uh, were absolutely right in what they said. I'm, I'm most grateful to him. The noble Lord has heard serious warnings about the potentially dangerous consequences of a failure by the government to consult adequately mm. uh, and, and work closely with the devolved administrations. Um, <clears throat> he will know that, the, that in Wales his well, upbeat assessment of the achievements and benefits of the Joint Ministerial Committee is not widely shared. If he will commit the government uh, to uh, consult and work closely with the devolved institutions along the lines laid out in this amendment, and if he will commit the government to do so on its honour, then I think that would do a very great deal to improve trust, confidence, and to ensure good practical outcomes. Will he do that? I say again that um, it is our absolute wish and intention to engage constructively with the devolved administrations over the negotiations uh, ahead of us. Um, intergovernment relation, intergovernmental relations have always operated by the agreement of the UK government and the devolved administrations. We wish that pattern to continue. Uh, JMC's, uh, the JMCEN's existing terms of reference were agreed jointly 
but in October two, uh, 2016. Um, now, in my view, uh, and indeed uh, in others, uh, those, administration, th those terms of reference have served us well, but to set, those, to set the terms of reference in legislation would inhibit this joint process. To legislate for this, apart from anything else, would anticipate the outcome of the review of inter intergovernmental relations due to be discussed with the devolved administrations next week at the JMCEN. Putting JMCEN's terms of reference in legislation would preempt uh, those conversations and restrict the uh, ability of the various administrations to develop future intergovernmental structures, such as the JMCEN, to reflect the constitutional relationship between the UK government and the devolved administrations once the UK leaves the EU. I hope noble lords will appreciate how important it is for the JMCEN to have the flexibility for its role to develop and adapt as the negotiations progress. Indeed, the, the terms of reference proposed in this amendment seem to me to be narrower than the current agreed terms of reference. Those existing terms refer, and I quote, to issues stemming from the negotiation process which may impact upon or have consequences for the UK government, the Scottish government, the Welsh government, or the Northern Ireland executive. Whereas this amendment would restrict the focus to economic and security matters. In fact, if one reads the, the current terms of reference in full, I believe they're miles better than uh, those suggested in the amendment. My lords, the, the essential point remains that a fixed statutory basis would not support the flexibility required to ensure that the JMCEN can operate as effectively as possible, which is what we want it to do. I hope I've provided noble lords with assurances of the government's commitment to work collaboratively with the devolved administrations to discuss their requirements of the future relationship with the EU. And in the light of those assurances, I would respectfully ask the noble and learned Lord to withdraw his amendment. I'm grateful for what the Minister has said, but I fear that some, we have got to address the issues of devolution and our changed constitution. And the sooner we do that, the better. And looking to putting matters on the statute book seems to me inevitable. However, in the light of what has been said, disappointed though I am that he would not give the commitment that the noble uh, Lord Lord Hart asked for, I beg leave to draw, withdraw the amendment. Your Lordship's pleasure that this amendment be withdrawn. The amendment is by leave withdrawn. After, oh, beg your pardon. Uh, uh, in clause 37, amendment 18, Lord Dubbs. Yes. Uh, my, my Lords, uh, I've had a chance to read again the detailed debate we had at committee stage on this particular issue. Uh, and, and what I say is influenced by what, what I heard then and what, what, what I read. But can I repeat my gratitude to ministers for the time they've given me on these three occasions, uh, once on the phone and twice in meetings, to uh, give me the minister's point of view as to what the issue was. And um, I'm also grateful for the support and encouragement I've received uh, from many parts of the House, including from members of the Conservative side, who've been very encouraging, and um, uh, no names, of course, but, um, but I, I, I appreciate those words of encouragement. Can I just refer quickly to the Salisbury Convention? It came up last time. Uh, the Minister justified the, the position by saying, quoting from the Conservative Manifesto, and I, I quote here again, we will continue to grant asylum and support uh, to refugees fleeing persecution. I don't believe that that is an argument against this amendment. This amendment is very specific indeed. It is about family reunion, much, much too specific to be covered by this blanket provision in the Conservative, uh, in the Conservative <coughs> Manifesto. And therefore, I believe that what we have is an entirely new issue, which was not 
foreseeable, was, could not have been foreseen when, we, when the Conservative Manifesto was published or during, during the election campaign. May I just very briefly remind your Lordships of the history of this. In 2018, on a previous bill, uh, I moved an amendment to say that the existing provisions of the Dublin Treaty, of which we are members as, as an EU country, the existing provisions about family reunion should be carried through in the negotiations for when we leave the EU. We have an arrangement whereby a child in one EU country that has relatives in another can apply to join those relatives. It's a very simple and basic matter of family reunion. And what we wanted to be sure of was that this would be part of the negotiations and this provision would be retained even after leaving the EU. That became, through a large majority in this House, became part of the bill and was then endorsed by the government. There was no vote in the Commons, endorsed by the government and, and became part of the 2018 Act. And it is that provision which the government are seeking to delete in this, in, in, in this particular bill. Uh, and my wish is to uh, retain, retain the, the 2018 Act as, as, as it stood. Uh, and it's a very simple point, and I would have thought family union is one of the basic things that we all have to, we all have to believe in. And if there are young people who have worked their way, sometimes in hazardous and dangerous conditions, uh, from halfway across the world, from war and conflict in, in Syria or Afghanistan, and if their incentive is that they've got family here, surely it is right that we should take note of that and not close the door on them. My Lords, uh, we all know how awful the conditions are in northern France and on the Greek islands. I've been there a few times and other members of the House have been there as well. Uh, and it is shocking that young people, and others of course, are sleeping under tarpaulins near Calais or are sleeping on the, uh, on the Greek islands in dangerous conditions where the children are liable to be sexually assaulted at night because there isn't enough security. All of these things are simply, are simply dreadful. And, of course, it is not surprising that those that have reached northern France seek to come across um, Ill illegally, put it that way, uh, on the back of lorries or in dinghies, often in the back of lorries. Uh, and the traffickers take full advantage of that. And that is why, by giving young people legal routes to safety, we are thwarting the traffickers, as well as being humane in terms of giving them an opportunity to, 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 to join family, family, family members here. And unfortunately, uh, this sort of debate we, we've had on this sends a dangerous signal to young people, in, in, particularly in Calais well, and, and also on the Greek islands if they can get away from there, uh, and they, they will seek to do what we would all do, which is to say, well, if we can't join our relatives legally, we'll find another way of doing it if we can afford to pay the trafficker. But surely that is not a result which we, which we wish to impose, impose on, on, on the young people. And family reunion is one of the safe legal routes, absolutely one of the safe legal routes. Now the Minister in her reply last time and today will of course talk about the numbers of refugees, child refugees that this country has taken. And that's good, that's good. But of course the large number of them have, in them, have actually come illegally. They arrived in Dover or, or, or Dover or, or somewhere else on the south coast often uh, and we've taken them in, they've claimed asylum. But um, that, is not, uh, that, that does not justify the government in saying, well, we're doing this anyway, we don't need to do any more. Now, my lords, uh, I've been thinking hard about what ministers said to me about why they actually don't like this amendment. I'm bound to say I don't fully understand the argument and a lot of people I've spoken also do not understand the argument but maybe there's something, something I'd be missing. The government first of all said to me the 2018 Act, the provision there, was in the wrong bill. I don't think they said that when they accepted the amendment but they said it shouldn't be in the bill at all. Furthermore, the minister said to me, actually if you want it in the bill at all it should be in the immigration bill which is coming along. So wait for that. Actually, you don't need it in the Immigration Bill. You should have it in the Immigration Rules. You don't need any legislation at all. Can't you take our word for it? Now, the Immigration Rules don't work in terms of international, uh, in international arrangements, so that, that I don't think is a good enough argument. And as for the Immigration Bill, that is sometime in the future. I'm told it's going to come this year. 
but we don't know what will be in scope. And, you know, to look at opposition parties from the government benches and say to us, well, you've got something as an act, except that it's being removed, and maybe there's another act that'll come along and you can do it then. Well, uh, well that's, that's not how opposition works, and that is not how scrutiny of the government works. Surely, when we can take the initiative, that is, that is, what, that, that is what, 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 what we can do. Now, it's interesting that the government have already approached the EU some time ago on this issue. Uh, I understand there's been no reply yet, and perhaps, uh, well, we can, we, we can accept that for the, mo for the moment. Uh, I don't know what persuaded the government to do it, were it not that it was in the 20, 2018 Act. Otherwise, why did the government seek to write the EU about a provision which, was, um, which would have died after, after we left the EU, unless the government wanted to continue it? So I, I'm not totally clear what the point of, what the point of that letter was. Uh, in a wider sense, I'm also slightly puzzled as to whether the, the government hasn't been writing other letters to the EU that we don't know about yet um, in, in anticipation of the, the negotiations that will start at the end of this month. Uh, but that's perhaps too wide a question for, for, for this particular debate. Can I say, and I want to say as calmly as possible, uh, the Minister has also said to me, this is a matter of trust. Well, yes. I trust individual ministers when, 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 when they look me in the eye and say that's what they believe in. Of course, of course I do. But I look also at the behaviour of the government as a whole, either before the election or now. And I can just remind the House that when, when we had the 2016 uh, Bill Act, I moved an amendment to help children who didn't have family here. And that was opposed very much by the government. In fact, the then Home Secretary, uh, uh, right on to Theresa May, uh, urged me to withdraw the amendment. Uh, and and we, we had to get it, get, get, get it, vote, get it voted, voted through. And eventually, eventually, after it went backwards, or for, backwards and forwards once or twice, the government accepted the amendment. Again, Theresa May asked me to go and see her and said that the government proposed to accept the amendment. But it took a bit of an argument. It wouldn't have happened automatically. And similarly on the 2018 measure, the one I just referred to, uh, that was something which we had to vote on. The government didn't say, that's okay. They didn't say, you don't need it. They just opposed it. Uh, and so, you know, it's difficult to be faced with the question of trust. Of course I trust individual ministers. But um, I don't trust the government as a whole, if I can, if I can uh, d d draw that distinction. Now, uh, may, I, may I just refer to, I'm still puzzled, and I don't think we got it answered, in a letter that Baroness Williams wrote uh, on the 13th of January. And I'm puzzled by something which I did quote in the last, uh, at, at, committee, uh, at committee, and I'm still not clear what, what, it, what it fully meant. So may I, may, I, may I have the tolerance of the House to quote, to quote this again? Um, it is right that the statutory obligation to negotiate previously contained in section 17 of the Withdrawal Act is removed and not retained by this amendment so that the traditional division between government and parliament be restored and the negotiations ahead can be carried out with full flexibility and in an appropriate manner across all policy areas. I recorded before and I'm still puzzled by one or two things in, in that. Um, one is the traditional division between government and parliament. I think the debates about Brexit and all the challenging issues coming from Brexit have actually challenged some of the traditional divisions between government and parliament anyway. We're no longer where we were before. And I, think, I think we need to accept that. But there's also, I'm also puzzled by negotiations uh, uh, can be carried out with full flexibility in an appropriate manner across all policy areas. Now, the minister assured me that we were no longer going to consider refugee children's family union rights as a bargaining chip. Uh, uh, so that the negotiation must mean something else. On a more positive note, it might mean we're going to negotiate, as it said in, 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 in the 2018 Act, namely we're going to negotiate to continue the provisions of the D Dublin Treaty. If that was what they meant, okay, but that's not what, what they've been saying. But I, I'm trying to help the Minister by saying that is, that is, that, that is perhaps a, 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 more, a more charitable uh, interpretation. Well, as I want to draw my remarks to, to a close. So to say this, of course not all public opinion agrees with this, but I have a sense that public opinion has been broadly supportive about child refugees and our obligations, our humanitarian obligations as a country. If the argument is put to the British public, they tend to respond positively. I'm not arguing about immigration as a whole, I'm arguing about, about, about child refugees. 
The noble lord concludes his very persuasive remarks. May, might I just ask him to put into context for the House the numbers of unaccompanied children that we're talking about in the context of World Refugee Day last year with 70.8 million displaced people or refugees in the world, a further 37,000 becoming displaced every single day of the year. The modesty of what was incorporated by your Lordship's House and put into law should speak for itself. Will the Noble Lord just remind the House of just the small numbers of people, the most vulnerable of all, that this amendment deals with? Uh, I, I, I'm grateful to the Noble Lord. Well, I'm not sure I've got every figure at, at, at my fingertips, but let, let, me, let me do my best. Under the 2016 Act, that was Section 67, that was the argument about children being able to come to Britain without having family here. Uh, the government capped that total at 480, and I understand we're quite well short of that even today. The 480, the government said, was limited by the ability of local authorities to find foster families. Mm. That is, however, not the, not the case with children joining the relatives here. We're clearly we're not, talking, we're not talking about local authorities having to find foster places. Uh, what, we're, what we're simply talking, talking about is a provision which I think to date several hundred, the Minister may correct the figures, several hundred have come un, under, un, under the family reunion provisions in the, 20, in the Dublin Treaty, and maybe, maybe we might be talking about 800. I think without having the exact figures, we're probably talking on the Greek islands and in northern France about a thousand or a thousand plus, but not that many, which in the context of the international situation is of course very few. And the Minister has said that, 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 that we've taken a certain percentage of the, of, the, of the EU total in this. Yes, we have. Uh, probably only in, in relation to the size of the country we are. But I, I, I don't dis, 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 dispute that figure, the ministers, but I, I think we are dealing with, if we take refugees in a wider sense, we're dealing with what's going to be the most challenging issue to the whole world and the challenging issue to Europe and to ourselves over many years. But what we're talking about here is a very small, a small number of children will be positively affected by, by, by this measure. And that's why I, I, I'm pretty keen on it. We had a small demo in, in Parliament Square yesterday. A lot of people there supporting it. We've had over 200,000 signatures in a petition, uh, again, supporting this provision. I believe we are essentially on the side of public opinion. But I believe we are essentially on the side of humanity. I beg to move. Yeah. Yeah. Amendment, uh, amendment proposed, leave out clause 37. Um, um, Lord Dubbs in committee, and I support him now. I need to declare an interest. I'm a trustee of the Refugee Council. I also need to declare total bafflement. I have absolutely no idea why Clause 37 is in this bill. I, I, I do not understand what the government are planning to do. And I did take part in the, in the uh, committee stage, and I did speak on this and listen to the Minister at second reading, and I still am none the wiser as to why it's here. Uh, what is on the statute book now in the 2018 Act is a commitment that the government will seek to negotiate a reciprocal arrangement for these poor children. What this clause does is repeals that requirement and replaces it with a commitment in almost this, exactly the same terms to make a statement to the House, to make a statement to Parliament, which is not a, a, a very strong uh, commitment. Uh, why does the government want to uh, repeal the 2018 Act in this respect? Well, we've had three possible explanations. One, that it's unnecessary to keep this on the statute book because the government do intend to negotiate on this matter. And the, the noble lady, the minister, told us that a letter had been written. Second explanation, that it is, it was always inappropriate to the, uh, the 2018 Act. Third explanation, that uh, 
it's important not to tie the government's hands. The first explanation seems to me uh, not to uh, be very easy to understand. If the government is seeking to negotiate and has written a letter designed to open negotiations on this matter, why should it want to repeal the commitment to negotiate? Why? <laughs> it doesn't make any obvious sense to me. Second, inappropriate positioning in the 2018 Act. Much better put it in the new immigration bill. But there is no new immigration bill as yet. And these negotiations are about to start. Second, the government aren't removing from the statute book any reference to this issue. They are replacing it with the language you see in the bill, in, in the clause. So if the 2018 provision was inappropriately placed, the 20 20 provision the government is seeking is inappropriately placed. So I don't understand that one. Thirdly, it isn't a matter appropriate to an Immigration Act, because what we have in the 2018 Act and what we have in this bill is a reciprocal requirement. The idea is that the government would negotiate to ensure that the 27 would be willing to take chil uh, poor children who are in this country, in this plight, and would be able to join their uh, family somewhere elsewhere in the 27. A provision for the emigration of small children would be highly inappropriate to an Immigration Act or Immigration Regulations. It follows, as I believe, that the argument inappropriately placed falls. The third argument is, is, is still more difficult and, and slightly awkward. Lord Keane said at second reading, I'm sorry not to see him here today, uh, uh, he said at second reading that it is vital that the government are not legally constrained in this matter. And the noble lady, um, Baroness Williams, uh, said that the government don't wish to see their hands tied. But, my lords, there's nothing in uh, the 2018 Act that ties their hands. They must seek to negotiate. We are not saying that they can't conclude a deal unless they have successfully negotiated. I don't myself think it's very likely that the negotiation on this point would fail, but we're not saying that if it failed, everything is off. We're simply saying, please have a go. I don't see how that ties anyone's hands. Now, this is where it gets awkward. Uh, having tried to understand the arguments that have been advanced by the government, all three of them, one is left just a little suspicious. And when we remember, as Lord Dubbs has reminded us, that his 2016 action for uh, uh, unaccompanied children was hotly resisted by the government, and when we recall, as he said, that although we were promised at the dispatch box that 3,500 of these children would be let into this country, though we weren't allowed to put that in the, the bill because that would have made it a money bill or something. We were given a promise, actually only 480 children have, have been looked after. When we remember that the 2018 provision was hotly opposed by the government, one is left slightly suspicious that the government don't intend to negotiate very hard on this maybe they envisage it as a concession, a, a pawn that could be given away in negotiation to secure something more important. I don't think that's what the country thinks. I agree with Lord Dubbs. Wearing my Refugee Council hat, I see a lot of evidence 
that the country takes this very seriously indeed, and that of all the issues we are discussing here, some of them constitutionally very important, some of them politically very important, of all the issues we are discussing on this bill, this is probably the one which has the most public resonance, that these unfortunate children should be looked after, and why the government want to take out of the statute book a commitment to try to look after them is something that the public will not understand. So I strongly urge the government to withdraw this clause. If they don't, I hope Lord Dubbs will seek to press his amendment. Yeah. Yeah. Lords, um, I uh, speak from these benches again, recognising the argument has been made again and again. Uh, I'm honoured to follow Lord Kerr and concur with all that he said. As my noble friend, the Right Reverend Lord Bishop of Worcester, reminded this House last week, he kindly spoke for me because I couldn't be uh, present at the committee stage. This debate resonates with the nativity story, a story of a, a child fleeing persecution. The voices of these children are too often drowned out by conflict and violence, by traffickers and by political leaders too. Let this House speak on their behalf by voting for this amendment. Let me try and explain again why the government's change is proving so difficult for those who work with these migrant children to accept, and thus why many in this House find it difficult too. As Lord Doves reminded the House at committee stage, and again just now, the government opposed his amendments on previous occasions. The law as it stands was hard fought for, not easily won. Thus, the proposed removal appears to be the government saying, well, we never really wanted the Dubs amendments, so now here is a chance to remove them. I note that in the Conservative Party manifesto there is a reference to welcoming refugees, but the lack of specific reference to child refugees and family reunion simply adds to public concern. I fully accept the Minister's own personal commitment to migrant children. I also accept that there is every intention to offer welcome and to maintain family reunion. But what the Government's proposals have conveyed is quite the opposite. I wrote to the Minister with a suggested compromise. But I accepted in my letter that it might not work as a proposal. But what I am struggling to understand is why the government cannot see that the message they are conveying at present is a negative one, whatever their good intent. From these benches, my right reverend colleagues and I view this particular issue as a moral bellwether for the future of our country. We want to be known as a country that is welcoming, compassionate and committed to playing our full part in responding to the deep issues that arise from the reality of refugees around the world. I believe the Minister and the Government do want to act with compassion. It is simply that what is proposed is not conveying this. Lord Dubbs has mentioned that for some this is cast as an issue of trust. Do we trust that the Government will deliver its promises to vulnerable children without legislative assurance in the EU withdrawal bill? However, this is not, to, uh, to my mind, not only a simply a matter of trust, but of priority. Where do the government's priorities lie? It is important that the government can negotiate a good deal for this country with our European neighbours. But we cannot set this against our responsibility to protect vulnerable children. That is what Clause 37 suggests, that the government's priorities, ne priorities necessarily mean we cannot give legislative assurance that we as a nation will provide for vulnerable children to be reunited with their families in safety. I am sure that is not the government's intentions, but our actions testify to our values. The action of including Clause 37, removing the family reunion obligation from primary legislation, speaks louder and will be heard further beyond this place than promises of other legislation yet to be enacted ensuring that there are safe, legal, effective and managed routes for child refugees to be reunited with their families in this country must remain an imperative. Schemes like community sponsorship, I have to declare my interest as a trustee of RESET, 
are an international gold standard for how to welcome refugees and provide new opportunities for those who have lost so much. We can hold our heads high because of the Government's work in recent years to support re refugee resettlement here. Now is not the time to contradict this good work with the consequences of Clause 37. Will we be open, sharing our prosperity and opportunity with children who deserve so much more than the precarious life of a refugee and have so much more to offer? Or will we be close to them, shut off from the world and our responsibilities as a global power? I believe the choice is clear. This is why I am sponsoring this amendment and urge others to support it and the government to accept it. My, my Lords, I too have my name to this amendment as I had at the previous stage. Um, like others, I want to thank uh, Lord Dubbs, who's in danger of becoming a noun, I think. Um, my Lords, I've been wondering and actually hoping um, whether Clause 37 might be the result of the attentions of an, I can put it this way, over-diligent draftsman who's failing to see the wider picture of how this looks, modern parlance would say, the optics. We were told a statutory, a statutory negotiating objective is neither necessary nor the constitutional norm. Well, not necessary, but not unnecessary either. And a constitutional norm? Well, is that such a, a, a straitjacket of a convention that we can't actually say what we mean in legislation? Mm. The noble and learned Lord Mackay, as ever, put the constitutional point very clearly at the last stage. And he said that... Um, Clause 17 of the 2018 Act is an instruction to the executive to, and I quote, open negotiations in a certain way, and that it's not up to Parliament to give instructions. I hope I've represented him, him properly. But as noble lords will recognise, and as um, the noble lord Will Kerr has said, Section 17 is only about opening negotiations, seeking to negotiate. Without even getting into the relationship between Parliament and the Executive, what harm, even if it's not normally how it's done, even if it's not terribly elegant, but it has made Parliament's view clear and it was accepted by the Executive in 2018. Um, I'm on the same page as the Noble Lord Lord Kerr. Um, I'm puzzled and I'm a bit suspicious, because when there's a rather technical point, a technical amendment, because we're being told that this is a rather technical point, on a sensitive issue, my antennae are naturally twitching. And the more the government tells us that they're not making any real changes, but they change the words, the more my antennae wave round, trying to catch a hold of what this is all about. I'm not surprised that the phrase in the Minister's letter about carrying out negotiations, to quote again, with full flexibility, in an appropriate manner across all policy areas, was much referred to. Section 17 doesn't restrict that, though it doesn't mention reciprocity as the government did, but I don't think that's material. I, I raised a point last um, week about the differences in wording, about the reference to the child's best interests. Under the um, existing provision, the child's best interests are in, referred to in co the context of coming to the UK. Clause 37 applies the best interests to joining a relative. I actually think both of those are important. But the, the government was assuring us that there's no significance. Uh, I don't want to let something that might be important go unchallenged. The minister referred me to the term equivalent circumstances. 
and she, she's nodding at that. But it's not in the same part of the clause. It's in paragraph, um, subparagraph B, um, uh, uh, not in, in little a. And I, I don't think it does answer my best interests question. Um, I asked the minister last week if um, uh, she could make available the, a copy of the letter to the Commission from last October, which she told noble lords should reassure us, and she wasn't sure she could do so, um, as she's not been able to pursue that. I assume it's not available, um, but I wonder whether she can confirm whether it is or it isn't. But coming back to this change, or proposed change as it still is, it must mean something. It doesn't appear to make the objective of the very modest Section 17 any more achievable, certainly not to most noble lords who have spoken. And noble lords will understand that given the subject matter of the clause and the individuals, the very relatively few individuals subject to it, there is a strong feeling that Parliament should not reduce our commitment to these children or to safe and legal routes or a point made by the right Reverend Prelate be thought to be doing so. As um, the noble Lord Dubbs made clear in his opening remarks, this is a question of trust. He, he seemed to suggest that uh, he trusted my noble friend, the Minister, but he didn't trust the Government. I'm not quite sure how happy my noble friend will be being described as a sort of semi-detached member of the Government. Um, but let's ignore that. Uh, words, um, uh, actions speak louder than words. The, the Government has a very credible record in allowing child refugees into this country. And so the only basis on which this amendment can be supported is on the basis that a number of refugees, I think we run third in the EU of, uh, of countries that have allowed child refugees in, so we've got a very credible record on this, that if this amendment is defeated, the government will then stop taking any further child refugees in. I think that defies all credibility. I don't think there's any basis um, that you can possibly support that thesis. And I take the view that we have done very well on the question of child refugees. If it's not broke, don't mend it. My, my Lord. Oh. Listening with interest to what the noble Lord has just said, um, I entirely accept that the government has done some very good work. And we heard that from the noble lady, the minister, last week. We ought not to undervalue the extent to which the government has brought children to this country. But we are talking about a very small group. As the noble Lord, Lord Alton, asked uh, of Lord Dubbs, uh, we, it might be a thousand. And in the grouping of children about whom we speak, this is a small group. What they have rights only under Dubs 3. I may have unintentionally misled the House last week, and I therefore apologise by making a comment I felt so strongly about this matter, I got carried away and I didn't read my notes, and I may have led the House to believe that there was some English law that actually provided a um, right for children. And I was wrong. I was very rightly corrected by the noble and learned Lord Mackay, who very kindly didn't refer to me when he set out the existing position. The existing position is that Dubs 3, I'm uh, sorry, Dubs 3, Dublin 3, but I really ought to call it Dubs 3, actually, <laughs> that Dublin 3 comes to an end in January of 2021. <coughs> Of course I trust this, the noble lady, the minister, and have the huge respect for her and for her genuine commitment to children. What I'm concerned about is urgency. It would be very easy for this government, intentionally or unintentionally, with everything else that goes along on uh, Brexit, not to have a priority as the no, the. Uh, Lord the Prelate had said, um, 
about these children. What we need is to retain the sense of urgency. That we don't find in Clause 37, but we do have to a greater extent in Clause 17, or in Section 17 of the 2018 Act. It's not taking us all the way, but it does include the requirement for things to happen. And I just am not happy with everything that has been said today and everything that I fear may be thought behind the scenes that this will be dealt with with a proper regard for urgency so that from January of next year, these children who have a right to come to this country, who are among the most deprived and vulnerable children in the world, will lose a right they have to come here unless a degree of real realism and urgency is injected into the government. My Lords, can I just uh, I agree entirely this lack of urgency? Um, also, I feel a lack of enthusiasm for any sort of um, legislation that, that, that will mean that there are more, more possibilities for people to come for sanctuary in the United Kingdom. I remember with great sadness that day some years ago when we voted on Lord Dubbs's amendment and I saw the Tory benches trooping through the not content lobby. I really felt so sad then. And in the years since, and I've been quite uh, uh, assiduous in dealing with these matters and the minister sure, surely must be tired of my contributions. But you know, in 12 years, the only change we've managed to get, or I've managed to get, is to change the Assure card for the Aspen card. The only change. Or just a card, £35 in one way or another. While we've still got no right to work until 12 months are up, and even then, only from a restricted list, we also have still indeterminate detention. We still have Home Office decisions that in 2005, 17% were overturned on appeal. Last year and previous years, they're about 40%. We still have tremendous, tremendous um, reluctance by the government to, to move. And that is why I am totally opposed to removing any sort of legislation uh, that we have at the present time in the European uh, agreements to, 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 to protect child um, right, uh, asylum seekers. So I would say, you know, I won't st speak for long, I've spoken too long on this over the years, but ju just plead with the government. There, there are so many decent people on those benches. And yet, when we had the previous vote, well, Lord Dubbs' amendment some years ago, you were voting against the rights of children. And please, please, there's an opportunity now to strike a new um, cord, and that will be to retain hospitality rather than hostility towards arrivals seeking sanctuary in the United Kingdom. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Lords, um, I think uh, I share <coughs> an admiration uh, for Lord Dubbs with almost every member of this House. Mm -hmm. He has been determined and dogged on this issue. Um, and uh, Perhaps I speak more as a former Home Office Minister in this House than as a former Chief Whip when I say that I understand the arguments and I can see where Lord Dubbs is coming from. But what this bill is about is about providing a framework under which the Government can enter into negotiations um, and withdraw from the European Union on the 31st of this month. We know what the Government has said all through the period of negotiations Dublin 3 will apply and we will be doing what we have done in action. You can see with the, the figures that are, uh, are before us that uh, um, there have been 4,100 children since the start of um, 2010 
um, found homes in this country. Um, there's a particular category, and Lord Dubbs's amendment is particularly concerned with trying to maintain the unaccompanied children. But there too, the numbers that have been shown by this government, and after all, as I say, I was a, a minister, Home Office Minister in the Coalition Government, where the noble lords sitting on the Lib Dem benches were actually my partners uh, in um, maintaining this policy uh, throughout that period. So I think it's important to understand that within this House there is, uh, there is some unanimity of, of uh, purpose about this Act. Uh, but what is worrying for me, as a, uh, a former member of this Government, and sitting on this, these benches is the lack of trust that the noble lords have shown in the commitments made by my successor in the Home Office, um, my friend uh, Lady Williams. Nobody has worked harder to convince people uh, of the intentions of this government. Nobody has spoken with greater authority on the subject than her on this matter. As, uh, as my noble friend uh, Lord Hamilton of Epson said, um, it's a distressing thing that, the, that this House is not prepared to believe what is being said on behalf of the Government by a Minister on this issue. I think that this is a problem which somehow or another this House is going to have to come to terms with because uh, um, I went to the briefing meeting in Room 10A last week, as did an, uh, an awful lot of people. I think the truth <coughs> of the matter is that the room was convinced of the intentions of my uh, noble friend and the responses that she was able to give. Um, the, this Withdrawal uh, Agreement Act is not about providing specific negotiating instructions to the government. It is about uh, providing the authority of the government to actually enter into negotiations. The, the government has made a manifesto commitment on this matter. Um, it may not be as specific as Lord Dubbs would have liked, but its general application applies. And therefore, um, the, to suggest that the government will be negotiating in bad faith and not to try and find a long-term solution. We all know this um, area of joint activity with our <coughs> European colleagues needs agreement. It needs to be understood what we're all going to do to try and deal with these difficult cases of, of individual children uh, and migrant uh, refugees in, in, in general. But I, I would say to, um, to Noble Lords that for my part, I think Lord Dubbs may well be um, making a point, but is he being effective in helping the government achieve that objective? by seeking to promote uh, his amendment. I think not, and that is why I will oppose um, the uh, amendment that he is facing before it, and I urge other noble lords to do the same. Sit down. Will you be good enough to explain to me, who has just been listening to what has been said in this debate, why the government put this in mm. this bill yeah. if it has nothing to do with what where the government should be doing in the negotiations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, my lords, the truth of the matter is that the government is not uh, seeking to put in this bill instructions as to the sort of negotiations which it is uh, undertaking. That is not the purpose of this bill. And uh, the uh, um, uh, 
agreement that uh, uh, the Lord Dubs forced uh, on the government uh, did in fact create that situation. The reason why the House is so nervous, not that we um, in any way um, don't um, trust the word of the noble lady, the Minister, it's just that the Prime Minister has got a habit of saying one thing on Europe and then doing another thing. So it's not the lady, uh, it's not the noble lady, the, the, the Minister, it's the person at the top of the government that the trust may uh, not emanate from. Uh, and let's be clear, let, let's go through this logically in terms of what this is about, as some noble lords have done. Uh, the first issue, following uh, the noble Lord Lord Taylor, uh, is just said. Uh, section 17 of the 2018 Act is an instruction to negotiate. It gives absolutely no conditions of those negotiations. The same as the uh, new um, um, uh, Clause 37 before us now. The difference is that the Clause 37 before us now gives a two-month period before a new policy will lay before Parliament. We have no idea what's going to be in that policy whatsoever. There could be changes. So it may not be as clear and as watertight and as concise as what Lord Dubbs is seeking to do in terms of the previous amendments that he's put through and what he's trying to do in this particular clause. Now, noble lords have said, and particularly on the government bench and some on the cross benches, that the government has a good track record on this. Let's be clear. The government has a track record of trying to stop Lord Stubbs' amendment in 2016, 2018 on this. And the only reason now the British government has got a good record is because Lord Dubbs has absolutely forced both houses to make sure that we carry out the obligations which we're now carrying out. As Lord, the noble Lord Lord Dubbs has said, on many occasions, Home Secretaries have pulled him in and asked him to withdraw the very obligations which the government are now trying to claim credit for. That's why trust is not great on this issue as well. And logically... No one's, no one's hands are going to be tied behind their back if we take the noble lady, the minister, at her words. Because on the 15th of, uh, the 15th of this month, in uh, the committee, uh, day two committee, she said, our policy on this has not changed. Therefore, you can lay the policy before the House now, then. Why the two-month wait? Uh, is the Minister giving an absolute guarantee that not one <coughs> word will change within the policy? If the policy has not changed, then you have already told those who we're negotiating with within Europe exactly what the policy of this government will be. More detailed than what the um, amendment... Uh, uh, oh, oh, sorry, what, the, what, what Lord uh, Dubbs is trying to do to, by, by making sure that Clause 37 doesn't go through. The real issue here is that if Section 17 of the 2018 Act went in place, the only difference is the government would negotiate, which he says it's going to do because it sent a letter, but there wouldn't be the two-month wait where policy would be laid before this House and things could have changed and the guarantees and the policy could be watered down and leave the most vulnerable children of all uh, more vulnerable than they are now. And that's why those of us who support what Lord Dubbs is doing, it's because of that policy and the two months and the potential watering down. And as I've said, the trust isn't with the Minister, but the Prime Minister says one thing about leaving the European Union to gain favour, and then when he has his chance, changes his view. Uh, I will be brief, but I do feel moved to speak on this, uh, particularly as the speeches have piled up. I want first, though, to, uh, to commend uh, the Right Reverend Prelate on talking about this as a moral yeah. bellwether. <coughs> in my own uh, speech earlier in the debate on this matter, I also said that I thought it was a as much a moral and ethical matter as it was a political uh, and legal one. And I genuinely believe that. And I, I believe that the issues of trust that we're now getting into 
are, are a difficult area for us. But the issue here is not just about trust. It is, uh, uh, as the noble lady opposite said, a matter of priority, and indeed the, uh, the right Reverend Prelate said, it's a matter of priority and of urgency. Uh, and uh, the noble lord has just said, why do we need a two-month delay if it is that there is a commitment from the government to maintain the position? And in terms of uh, the manifesto with which the government, the now elected government, went to the country, there were commitments on refugees, but not specifically on child refugees, and not beyond that which was in the 2018 Act. So it certainly seems to a number of us uh, on these benches who have spoken, and of course many who haven't, that this is both a moral issue but also an extremely urgent issue of priority. And those of you who were in the House uh, for the remarks uh, made in this debate uh, by the, the noble lady, <coughs> Baroness Hamwe, where she read from uh, a letter, a piece of writing, from a child in a classroom in this country. I think it's really important that we understand the profound sense with which the British people understand that child refugees are a group with whom we must go to the utmost to deal properly. It really is a matter on which I believe there is profound uh, uh, commitment to make sure that children, the children who have come through some of the most difficult circumstances that we can possibly imagine, and who have the prospect of being reunited with members of their family, because that is the group of children with whom we are dealing here in this amendment, they have that prospect of so much better a life. It simply seems to many of us on these benches, and indeed the cross benches, and I'm sure probably some noble lords opposite, that that is not something that we, sh we can let go lightly, and therefore I urge us all to vote for this amendment. My lords, just, just briefly to, to sum up, I think the noble lady minister will have heard the strength of feeling uh, in this House, and the a state of uh, perplexity and bewilderment at uh, the, uh, the legislative uh, record on this as, as to uh, you know, the fact that it is in the 2018 Act, uh, that there was no provision in the first version of this bill to delete the uh, section in the 2018 Bill, and therefore, um, in terms of continuity, uh, the, uh, the, the position would point to the government accepting uh, the amendment from the noble Lord, Lord Dubbs. And it surely would be the, 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 the graceful and gracious thing for the government to do to accept this amendment. I think the, the strength of feeling uh, no doubt indicates to the government uh, that they might otherwise have to deal with the situation where there is a vote uh, in this House, and um, there, there is a way out for the government, and I would very much hope the noble lady will be able to take that way out. My Lords, the debate has been eloquent, and emotion has played its part. I must begin by uh, paying yet another tribute, second time today, to the noble Lord, Lord Kerr, um, who has proved to have an expertise in the area of bafflement as much as anything else, and the way, the clever way that he unpicked the strands from the balls of wool that had got tangled up and pulled them out for us to look at just left us totally bewildered that when it all settles back again, we understand as little as we did before he began. <laughs> I have listened to the arguments, and Lord Taylor, of, of, of Holbeach, for whom I have nothing but respect, um, will need, I think, to listen a little harder for 
the nature of a lack of trust that is not dependent upon political adversarial positions, but a genuine feeling that we're at a moment in our parliamentary history where we've lost the art of building consensus and taking an argument forward with the respect and even affection we have for each other when we're outside the debating chamber. And it does seem to me that in this debate we've reached that sort of point. It is a source of great wonderment to me that something put in an act just 18 months ago is now not in it and that arguments are being put forward to justify taking it out in a way that certainly I don't understand but then it's a long time since I took my Bachelor of Arts degree and perhaps I am getting addled in my old age. But I don't understand it. It's a small group of children and with relatives limiting the number even further for whom on the part of a government that has already done so well in the area of looking after the interests of children they can't see how no it's not an instruction to the government to do this or do that that we're seeking to put into this amendment not an instruction to do it's not outcomes it's to start or to keep alive a process of negotiation on this particular issue it does have a moral dimension. The right Reverend Prelate is quite right. Um, and, and we must never forget that. Um, now, and also, the, the, the noble lady, Lady Butler um using the word urgency and the mention of two months and all the rest of it just reminds us that we have a chance here to put this into the bill in a way that gets things started at once for an objective which I can't believe there's a single person in this house that would refuse to want, to desire. I don't know. I don't know. I'm new to this game of politics. Um, <laughs> and uh, I try my best. I really do. Uh, Baroness Hamwe, quoting the noble and learned Lord, Lord Clashfern, Lord Mackay of Clashfern, um, did emphasize that point that nobody's seeking to tell the government what to do or what point to reach in what it does. No, there's a difference between outcomes and process. All we want on the face of the bill is that a process be entered into. Outcomes will depend on the negotiations. That's the desire here. And so I do hope other people have spoken so eloquently. I do, I do hope I do hope that in the spirit of generosity uh, there's no riding of high horses because we've won an election. It is humanity, as the noble Lord Lord dubs. It's in the school of humanity that we'll be judged, not our party partisan positions. No, the noble Lord, Lord uh, the noble Lady Lady Williams is, is a, another person I've listened to with enormous respect in the short time that I've been doing this sort of work. And I hold her in that respect now. Yesterday, we had an agreement forged between, uh, via the usual channels, um, for a stance on an issue that would happen later in the evening. In the course of the afternoon, that stance was totally modified, and we had to take our people through the lobbies in an entirely different way. Now, if that can happen in an afternoon, uh, then perhaps there's some justification for trust needing to be earned. So the matter is before us. We'll, I'm quite sure, be asked to vote on it. But it's a terribly serious thing about the body politic in this country. And this is an admirable piece of a debate where we can learn the art of constructive engagement and putting together a better tomorrow. My Lords, uh, this is an important stage in the debate and um, uh, with the agreement of the usual channels, um, uh, we're going to put off uh, the rest of the debate till after lunch uh, and so uh, to allow people to, uh, noble Lords, to think about this and um, the Minister will um, uh, wind up after lunch. So with that uh, said, I, I beg to move that consideration on report be now adjourned.
The question is that further consideration on the report be now adjourned, as many of that opinion will say content, the contrary not content, the contents have it. I will also beg to move uh, that the House do now adjourn during pleasure until 2.30 p.m. The question is that the House do now do adjourn during pleasure until 2.30, as many of that opinion will say content, the contrary not content, the contents have it.